go, right? That's it, just flip the little switch and it's on? Cool, sorry, this is my first time, so I'm still trying to make sure I do everything right. I don't wanna have this automatically just disappear off the face of the planet after tonight. Um, before we get started, I do want to just say I have a lot of questions and I really would love a lot of discussion and dialogue tonight, uh, but I apologize if I talk to you like you're nine years old. It's just a sense of habit in what I do in my day job, <laughs> but I figured the best place to start would just be reading the parable itself. So today we're going to be starting with the parable of the wedding feast, which you can find in Matthew chapter 22 if you want to turn there. Could I get a volunteer to read, please? Go ahead, Ryan. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. Again, he sent out other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fattened livestock are all butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized the slaves and mistreated them and killed them. But the king was enraged, and then he sent his armies to destroy those murderers and to set the city on fire. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main highways, and as many of them as you can find, invite to the wedding feast. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they had found, both evil and good. And the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw that many there were not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to them, Friend, how do you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to his servants, Bind him hand and foot, and throw him into the outer darkness, in the place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Awesome. Thank you. So first, right off the bat, I want to kind of give a little bit of context to where this parable takes place in the story of Jesus. In the previous chapter, we had just had the triumphal entry. So this is Jesus' final week, and we are in the temple. In this setting, <coughs> pardon me. Uh, his authority was challenged by the religious leaders of the time, and prior to this, he had just cleansed the temple of the money changers and the seats of those who sold the pigeons. And this is the following day. So if we start in chapter 21, verse 23, you can see, and when he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? And Jesus replies to those religious leaders through his questioning on the authority of the baptism as John. And after they don't have an answer for that, he gives these three parables. And the parable of the wedding feast is the third of those. And although the audience of these parables was these religious leaders, there are still a lot of things that we can take away personally that fit into our lives as well. So I broke up this parable into a few different parts of what I thought were the main sections of this. And the first part was chapter 22, verses 1 through 6, where the call to the feast was rejected. So this king has a wedding feast for his son, and he tells the servants to call those who are invited. If we're able to look at this from who the audience was and through the history of the Bible up to this point, we can come to the conclusion that Jesus was the son of the king, because God was the king, and the people that were invited were Israel. When the, king, when the people don't come, the king says to say that everything, or the people don't come, after the king says that everything is ready for the feast and the people continue to pay no attention, they come up with excuses like they have to get to their farm or their business or even to the point that some of them rebel against the king and mistreat and kill his servants. So if we are to come to the conclusion that God is the king, when have we seen in the Bible where people have rejected his call before?
Any other comments? A lot of these stories we hear of people that are doing things that are right in their own eyes as opposed to what's right in the eyes of God. And even though these people think that their reasons to not be able to come to this feast are legitimate, oh, I have to go to my field, I have to go to my business, at the end they're doing what's right in their own eyes instead of the eyes of God. If we continue on to verses 7 through 10, we see the response by the king. Who gets angry and has those who killed his servants be killed and destroy their city? because they showed they weren't worthy. Um, one thing that I also was connected to when it came to the idea of killing servants, I was looking back through Matthew whenever I was studying for this, and I was, came across the story of John the Baptist being killed in Matthew 14. So an example of these religious leaders at this time who consider themselves the people of God who killed one of God's servants. And I connected to this to the idea that God had retaliated and punished Israel because of their actions. And I was curious if we could come to other scenarios where God has responded to Israel's misfortunes and shortcomings in the past and even used other nations to interact with Israel. Not only do we have something that happened in the past, but something that is to come in the future as well, involving these same people. Anyone else? Where have we seen God use other nations to interact with Israel whenever they have shortcomings? So the whole book of Judges, I think, re repeats a pattern, right? Uh, the children of Israel disobey the, or, un or they are unfaithful to covenant they made with God. God allows some foreign power, frequently, frequently the Pharisees, to come in and oppress them for a certain period of time. And then God, the, the children of Israel cry to God for, uh, to, to save them. I think the main takeaway that I had for this was the idea that the king knew what was right and what was just in that situation. So for his servants being killed, he responded in the same way that God would whenever unrighteous things would happen. Um, moving on to the next part, which is a little more happier, is the king goes and tells the servants and invites to invite others, as many as you can find, so that the wedding hall would be filled with guests. And I was just curious what that means for us, who we are today because of this exact scenario.
Yeah, I think it is definitely such a great moment to see that it's if this one chosen people had failed that God gave the opportunity for everyone else to still have a chance to even enter his kingdom and to be invited to this great wedding feast. Does anyone else have any other comments on that? I feel like up to this point, a lot of this is pretty straightforward stuff if we want to go down that route for application. Goal. Do you have anything else, Morgan? I didn't want to cut you off. I'm glad you brought that up. I have that in just a moment. Can I get back to you on that? Awesome.
open it up to other people before I take a shot at it myself. But Nick, you want to go first? This is pure speculation, so I've never thought of that question. Mm -hmm. And I think, can I say something that I'll come to you, Ryan? I think the timing of it is super crucial, too, that it is Christ's final week right before that covenant starts with his death and resurrection to where that covenant does begin, almost as if they were already celebrating it with this parable. I think that's a great way to wrap up what that idea is. I hope we answered your question, Jared. Getting back to your question over here about the wedding garment, I was initially really curious about that as well. Why does this man not have a wedding garment? And I did a little bit of digging and research, and it didn't seem like there was maybe one universal answer as to why, but the message behind it was always the same. Some argued that it would have been expected for the king to have provided the wedding garment. So if that was the case, that man chose not to wear the wedding garment. So he didn't take this event seriously, like Ryan just talked about, where it's an important event for them to be a part of. Others said it would have been in reference to how they presented themselves. So as opposed to wearing just whatever you would have on the street and walked in, not that that was the only thing you wore or you had, but not cleaning yourself up and presenting yourself in a way that is showing reverence to the event that's going on would have been the wedding garment. Or the last one would have been the idea that this man may have been invited, but he didn't ever show the commitment, so he never would have gotten the wedding garment. So I think overall, the real message behind it was just this man didn't have the wedding garment because he wasn't taking the event seriously enough. He was just going through emotions and attending this wedding, expecting something without ever committing himself to this marriage or to be a part of this feast. Does that kind of answer your question? Okay. I think about also the last verse in this parable, the for many are called but few are chosen, as a part of that as well, to where we have to make a decision if we are to be invited to this wedding feast ourselves to make conscious decisions to change who we are to be a part of this event. So we have to put on the wedding garment for ourselves. I think it kind of goes into my next point, which was some of, I have not been keeping up with this, I just realized that. Some of my key takeaways from this parable, and the first, these are kind of all rhetorical questions that were kind of popping in my head asking myself as I was going through this study, which was, has God invited you, but you ignored his invitation? Have you had people in your life who have been trying to get you involved with the faith and you didn't make that decision yourself? Or have you put other things before God, such as the rich young ruler just two chapters before in Matthew 19, who knew he wanted to commit to God, but he still chose his possessions and his great wealth over Jesus in the time that it came to make that decision? And do we choose at times to ignore God's commandments? 
also the idea is, has God invited you, but you rebelled against him? I think of in our world that we live in, a lot of people know who God is, at least from a surface idea, but never want to dive deeper into what that actually means and who he actually is. So there may be an invitation, but you're like, no, I'm not going to worry about that. That's not a problem for me. I don't want to go to the wedding feast. That doesn't seem like fun to me. I think about Romans 2, and I'm going to catch my breath before I read all this, because otherwise I'll stop in the middle of it. Verses 4 through 11, if you want to turn there and read with me as well. Romans 2, verse 4 through 11. Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's judge, righteous judgment will be revealed. He will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal, eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek, for God shows no partiality. So I think that really does connect back to what we just saw in this parable where it was originally the Jews invited, but then everyone was invited. So God shows no partiality in who is able to receive the righteousness in the end. Adam? We got a lot of hands. I mean, I have to, I promise I want to get to everyone, but we got to speed it up a bit. Nick?
think something, and then Chad, do you still have a comment? It, it was just a, in, as like October hears all the comments in here called literature is fast now, like the era of the revolution. Yeah. Um, but, but as I read the parable, you know, like brought in everybody and it says the wedding hall was filled with guests, but then there's one person yes. that didn't. Yeah, I think that is a good point. I do think about those that maybe didn't attend as part of those that were called but not chosen as well. But I do think that's almost an uplifting thing for me to hear is these people are making the conscious decision to try to change and it was just this one person who never cared that was the one that was cast out. Not everyone was gone except for this one guy who did pretty good. So it is almost like a, making that decision is one of the most important parts. Benny, did you want to make a comment? Great point. I also, trying to put myself in the shoes of the servants going out and inviting, I'm not sure, I'm sure not everyone who they went up to was a friendly, respectful, no, I don't want to go. I'm sure they were very discouraged by some of the actions of the people who they were inviting, but they didn't stop. They kept inviting as many as they could. So even when you do face discouragement or people telling you no, that's not an excuse to stop because they didn't. Is there any more comments before we move on? Yes. I just always kind of get this parable confused with the other one in Luke 14 where it's like the banquet. And it, there's so many similarities, but it's not a wedding in that one. It's just a banquet. But some of the like excuses that people give in Luke 14 are just, you know, you just almost want to laugh at them. Like, what? You, you turned this down because you wanted to go dig a ditch or because yeah. you just got new oxen or you just got That's a perfect transition to our next slide, which is Luke chapter 14. <laughs> so if you want to turn over to Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 7, we're going to start there. So the actual parable of the great banquet starts in verse 12. But as I was reading through the first five or the five verses before it, I thought were so crucial to the setup of what this parable was that I really thought it was important for us to read those as well. So we're going to start in Luke chapter 14, starting at verse 7. Now he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, Give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lower place, lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Also, the he is Jesus. I probably should have said that before, but just in case, we're all on the same page for that. He said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. 
When one of those who reclined at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he said to him, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field, and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. <coughs> so for more context of this verse, in this parable altogether, Jesus is dining in the house of a ruler of the Pharisees on the Sabbath. And while he was there, he was talking with a man who had dropsy or edema, and he heals him in front of the Pharisees, and they're surprised by his actions. He's working on the Sabbath. And Jesus asks them a question about healing on the Sabbath that they can't answer. And then he starts to speak in these parables. And I do want to just compare how this one is different than an application that we'll get into because I think it's a lot more of a broad application for us. So starting in verse 12, Jesus tells the rule of the Pharisees that invited him to invite people who cannot repay him for a feast, not those that would be able to repay him because he'll be repaid in the end. And I read that verse and I was like, okay, how do I actually do this in my life? It isn't saying that we should never have friends over to eat or that we need to only invite those that are not a part of our lives. It's not saying that we shouldn't have friends or anything like that. But it means that we need to prioritize and support, prioritize support and hospitality in our lives, especially to those who cannot reciprocate those actions in a life of serving with a focus on the eternal spirit instead of focusing on things of the world. So instead of, as the other parable above it, where they were at the wedding feast up there, instead of focusing on things that put yourself in a higher status, inviting people that are higher than you, focusing on those that are lower than you that you can actually help and benefit and serve. Do I have any comments or anyone that wants to add on to that idea? It's not an easy thing to do. To go along with what Dave was saying, um, this is, like he said, a, a part of us being Christ-like or like God in that he gave something that we could never pay him back for. Right? So when you think about it that way, it makes a lot more sense because now you're like, oh, wow, okay, well, I'm not uh, ever going to come close to what God did for me, so the least I can do is like help out my fellow. 
I think the mindset is so crucial to where instead of finding ways to serve yourself, you're looking outwardly at how you can serve other people is the most important part. Morgan. Oh my goodness, we're almost out of time. This is going a lot faster than I expected when I first came up here. I think when we are looking at this story, one of the most important things that I wanted to go back over, since I'm going to try to do a faster version of this, is when it came to the master telling his servant who, servants to go, who he was going to go out and find. It wasn't the same thing. It wasn't go find the lords, go find the kings, the great people who are going to have these big promotions. No, it was go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the, of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And I was just wondering, how does that connect to the ministry that we had seen of Jesus up to this point, and how can we apply that to our lives as well? Awesome. I'm trying to think. Oh my goodness, it's been two minutes and like four seconds. <laughs> hmm. I think the last thing that I want to do is looking at the idea of how we can take this parable of the great banquet and apply it to our own lives as well when we receive blessings that are beyond anything we can reciprocate as Jared brought up earlier with Christ dying for us on the cross and the idea that everyone was invited to the banquet, everyone was invited to the great feast, but it's about us making sure that we make the actions that are right to be able to actually attend these events and to make sure that we are there and we're also encouraging and inviting other people as well. It doesn't have to be anyone glorious, but anyone who will listen that we should be inviting. I'll give you all the last word. No oxen is ever going to be better than the reward that we have. All right, thank you all for all your comments tonight. I really appreciate it. <laughs>